In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful, we all know how in the Gospels our Lord speaks of a sin against the Holy Ghost. And this is the sin of attributing uh, a work of the Holy Ghost to the devil. Calling something that the Holy Ghost has done to be actually something that the devil has done. Our Lord refers to this when he works a miracle, and then the Pharisees say that the devil worked it. And in the face of this blasphemy on their part, he says the following, Every kind of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven to men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this world or the world to come. Effectively, our Lord is saying that if, if you're so hardened, that you attribute the works of God to the devil, then there's no way that, that God will be able to help you. you. You are, as it were, impervious to the grace of God. God. The grace of God will not be able to reach you. Today I would like to speak about another sin against the Holy Ghost, which is kind of the reverse of, of what I've just mentioned, of, the, of this sin against the Holy Ghost that our Lord mentions. And this is not attributing what the Holy Ghost does to the devil, but it's attributing what we do to the Holy Ghost. So it's this practice of saying, well, what I do is necessarily what God wants in a situation where I don't really have a justification for claiming that. But I'm wanting to sort of instrumentalize the Holy Ghost, make use of the Holy Ghost in order to approve what I want to do and claim that my action comes from the Holy Ghost without sufficient reason. And it should be clear why I'm speaking about this on the Feast of Pentecost, because the Feast of Pentecost is precisely um, a, a feast where we recall how the Holy Ghost is supposed to be operative in our lives. It's supposed to be guiding our lives and inspiring our actions. We're supposed to be under the influence of the Holy Ghost on a regular basis. And so what I would like to discuss is, is this question of whether or not we're under the influence of the Holy Ghost, and especially those occasions when we claim to be under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and in fact we're not. In a sense, this is the source of hypocritical religion. This is a, a manifestation of hypocritical religion. Um, when people are claiming to be servants of God, when in fact they're not servants of God, they're just servants of themselves. They're just serving themselves. But there's so many examples of this in modern Christians. Sometimes, for instance, when you're speaking to, to Protestants, when you're discussing questions of faith with Protestants, the Protestant will say, well, you're against the Bible. I'm for the Bible, and you're against the Bible. And the implication is that their interpretation of the Bible is necessarily the interpretation of God, the sense that God wants to, to give to it. But that's not at all a given. And what we say is, well, no, I'm not against the Bible. I'm against your interpretation of the Bible. And you're assuming that your interpretation of the Bible is necessarily the sense of God. But I have no guarantee that you are the oracle of God who is able to give me the true sense of the Bible. As a Catholic, I go to the church for that. But, you know, you can't just assume that, that your interpretation is, is the right one just because it appeals to you. Other people, I mean, say, say things like, you know, God inspired me to have an abortion. I, was, I, I really felt like this is what God wanted me to do. And that's why I did it. And, and this is obviously a, a, a certain blasphemy in the, in the sense that there's no way that God would have inspired anyone to have an abortion. It's, it's offensive to God to, to take the life of, of an innocent child in the womb. But people um, want to use God as a way to justify what they do. And the general pattern here is that they claim God as a witness to the rightness of their own action when in fact they haven't consulted God or if they have consulted God, they've passed up what God wants them to do and they followed their own will. 
So, as I say, um, just as what our Lord referred to as being a blasphemy, the, the uh, attribution of a work of the Holy Ghost to the devil, so too, this other way, this other thing, this other um, practice of attributing what I do to the Holy Ghost when it's not, that's likewise a blasphemy. Because we're attributing evil to God. We're saying that God wants evil. When our, we're, we're in a state of error, perhaps, or when we're performing some immoral behavior and we're saying that God wants us to do that. So we must not rush to claim that our choices are the choices of God or that our behavior is the behavior that God approves. We should rather let God be the judge of our behavior than act as if our behavior is divine automatically by the fact that I want to do it. it no, God definitely wants that. Um, we should be much more focused on seeking to find the will of God than claiming that we act according to the will of God. But the thing is, and we all know this is true, to find the will of God is really difficult. It takes a lot of effort. And perhaps that's why people, people are often tempted to skip all those steps and jump right to the conclusion that God necessarily wants what perhaps I have already chosen to do. The first step for us to discover the will of God is to recognize that we have to ask him for his guidance. Um, it's not to assume that our desires and our inclinations are the same as God's desires and inclinations. That every movement in me is a movement of the Holy Ghost. There are lots of movements that are going on in our soul at every moment. Some of them may be from God. Some of them are definitely from God. Some of them are the grace of God. God guiding us or pushing us in a certain direction. But some other movements are movements from our emotion, there are movements from our will, there are movements from the devil. And what we have to do is we have to carefully separate, you know, all the various movements and, and make sure that we distinguish movements that are from ourselves or from the devil from the movements that are actually from the grace of God. So the first step is to recognize that we need to make a careful discernment. We need to actually think about this. Um, it's to stop. We, we just stop and recognize that I'm going to have to make some effort in order to discover the will of God. And this will keep me from making false claims that, that my will is identical uh, to the will of God or false claims about what God approves in me. The second step, as I say, is that we actually pray for light. It's astounding how even after long periods of time practicing the Catholic faith, we do not consult God in our decision-making processes. We just immediately start to reason and, and, and weigh and distinguish and, and measure things without stopping to reflect and, and ask God to say the prayer, perhaps to come Holy Ghost or what have you. Um, we must reflect and think about things but we also must ask God for light. If we do not ask God for light, then we cannot expect that we will be following the will of God. And the church teaches us this week, this whole week, how wrong this is. Because she's praying very earnestly, very constantly, and very perseveringly for guidance from the Holy Ghost. If we had the fervor of our mother, the church, in asking for guidance from the Holy Ghost we would surely make very few bad decisions in this life. But this, this intensity of prayer that we find in the liturgy, um, not just the Mass that you see today, the beautiful Mass that we have today with this beautiful sequence, but also the Divine Office that we, uh, that we priests pray, such intensity on the part of the Church, recognizing that we, without God's light, we are in total darkness. And to get that light, we have to ask for it, and ask for it, and ask for it, time and again. Because we can be easily deceived. We understand that it's so easy for us to get tricked. We might get tricked by the sort of environment of the world we live in, the zeitgeist of our times. Uh, we're, we're developing this secular spirit, we don't realize it. We can be deceived by our own passions, 
by our own inclinations that are not subject to reason or to grace. So we have to ask for help. The third step is, to, is the actual process of discernment, having this process of discernment, um, where we do take the time, especially in the big decisions. Obviously, we don't have to do this all the time. But especially in the big decisions of our life, we, we must have a process of discernment where we reflect, we, re, we pray to God, and we carefully weigh the, the various uh, decisions, the choices to be made in order to make the right choice. In this process, which we may say, I mean, we may call the, the art of life. In a sense, it's the art of life. We have this power as human beings to choose the path by which we direct ourselves and orient ourselves. And it, it, it's, it's a real art to, to make those right decisions. Here are some things we have to observe in doing that, in making this discernment. First of all, there have to be boundaries. This is the beautiful thing about our Catholic faith. It gives us boundaries. It gives us a framework in which we can make decisions. It gives us hard, fast principles. And we have this rule in our discernment that I cannot go against my principles. Principles are principles. And they're set in stone. And that's the golden rule. I can't break any of the principles in whatever decision that I make. Um, this is why it's so important for us to inform ourselves about the wisdom of the church. It's the church as, as our mother who teaches us what is right and what is wrong. And once we understand those principles, they, they, they are like the, the guardrails that will ensure that whatever decision we make, they will be within the, the range of what is acceptable. This is why it's so scandalous today sometimes when these, these churchmen bring up questions that, that should not be brought up because they're against principles. Should we give communion to the divorced and remarried who um, are, are not living as brother and sister? They, they have no intention of, of living in the state of grace, taking the proper steps to, to live according to the law of God. Should we give them communion? And they say, well, let's consider the situations. It's like, no. You don't even need to consider the situation. You don't need to look and see whether they're getting along, whether they have children, whether the context is favorable, um, whether it's working out. Because it's against principles. It's, it's against the law that marriage is indissoluble. And unless uh, they are taking steps to, to live according to, to the law of God, um, then you cannot give them communion. It will be a sacrilegious communion. Or the question of ordaining women. Should we ordain women? It's like, why are you even bringing it up? Because it's against principles. It's against hard, fast principles that do not change. It's settled. It's never going to change. So the, the, I, the implication is given when, bringing, when we bring these questions up for discussion is that, in fact, there is nothing solid, uh, lasting, firmly true in what we believe, that really everything is up for discussion. And this just totally disorients us. So, no, we have our catechism, and that is the bedrock of our decision-making process. Secondly, there has to be a great generosity on our part. We, we really have to work with ourselves and dispose ourselves to be ready to accept whatever God wants for us. You know the nation ex exercises, it's referred to as indifference. Well, sometimes this is a somewhat confusing term. It doesn't mean you don't care. It means that you have been careful to push aside all of your own inclinations, <coughs> to try to be as objective as, pro as possible. Say, well, if what, what is truly not what I want or what I'm inclining to, but what does God want truly? Um, and whatever that is, I'm perfectly willing to follow it. I, I, I ready myself beforehand to accept whatever the outcome of the decision-making process will be, even if it, it goes against my current inclination. Another thing that is so necessary in which our Lord, we may say, identifies in today's gospel is peace of soul. I think it's interesting um, how, 
how he speaks about the coming of the Holy Ghost, then immediately after that, it's sort of an instruction for them to prepare for the coming of the Holy Ghost. He talks about peace of soul. How necessary it is to have peace of soul. He says, The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your mind whatever I have said to you. Then immediately he speaks about peace of soul. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled or be afraid. So if our heart is troubled and we're not in a state of peace, then it's guaranteed that we will not be able to make a good decision. We've got to restore calm in our soul and interior peace before we're going to be able to see clearly what is actually the will of God. When we're disturbed, that's the time of the devil. The devil works in an environment of, of violence, an environment of chaos, an environment of disturbance. Whereas the Holy Ghost always works at a time of peace. And it's, it's our job to make sure that we um, place that peace in our soul so that the Holy Ghost can come. He's not going to be able to come unless it's already there. And to do that, we're going to have to have some silence and some recollection. We have to find some way of uh, sort of collecting our powers. This is, the, this is the origin of the word recollection. It's like you, you get away from things and you try, you know, your, your powers have been scattered to the four winds and you, you sort of gather them all together and, and bring them to a single point so, so that you're able actually to have your whole focus on the point at hand, on the question at hand, in order to make a decision according to God's will. Another thing that's quite important is consultation. We often need to speak to others whom we trust in order to get their advice. Sometimes we find that we're not even able to restore our peace of soul. We're so disturbed. We perhaps try to restore our peace of soul, and we can't. And that's especially time when we need to go to someone whom we trust and speak to them so that they can well, on the one hand, help calm us, but also give us a, a fairly objective view of our situation. This is why seminarians have spiritual directors. This is why husbands and wives are so important for them to discuss all the affairs uh, of their families in, in a state of calm, for them to, to bounce ideas off, off one another. This is why the church provides the confessional as a forum in, in which the faithful can ask advice, can say, Father, this is just the situation I'm, I'm going through. Um, what, do you, what do you think? What, is there anything you can say to, to help me out? So the, the last, last thing I want to mention is that sometimes in, in uh, uh, souls who, it's interesting that in souls who are very advanced in spiritual life, um, how they're able to tell even after they made the decision, whether it's the right decision or not, by their state of soul. Um, sometimes if they do not have peace of soul after making the decision, they realize that it probably was not what God wanted. When they've gone through the steps of making this careful discernment, they've prayed about it, they've consulted, they've, they've reflected, and then they finally make the decision. Then afterwards, they just feel something's not right. I'm, they're, they're very uneasy. That can be a sign of the, to them of uh, the fact that it's not the will of God. This is what would happen to Archbishop Lefebvre himself. And one of the most important decisions of his life, uh, the signing of, of the May 5 Protocol, 1988, um, sort of agreeing to this canonical structure for the Society of St. Pius X. Um, and he, he signed it, but he had still not been given a date for the consecration of the bishop, and there were some other things that were missing, and he couldn't sleep that night. He had, he had gone on retreats, he had consulted everybody, he had talked to everybody, and he finally made that decision, but he didn't feel right afterwards. He didn't have that peace of soul. And the, and the next morning, he, he wrote a letter to the Pope to say, well, you know, um, I just wanted to say that, that unless these conditions are fulfilled, I, I, can't, I can't go through with this. 
in order to place some, some additional conditions to what, to what he signed. Another example is from the life of Father Cizek, Father Walter Cizek, this um, Polish-American priest who uh, had the dream, who always had the dream when he was being formed of, of going into Russia and trying to convert the Russians. And he was in Poland, and then uh, there was, was World War II, and the, the Russians invaded Poland, took over Poland, and, and took over the place, the town that, that he was living in. And one of his fellow priests came to him and said, look, the Russians are asking for people to go into Russia and help out with work. And we have this opportunity, and now we can go to Russia. We've been looking to go to Russia for our whole life as priests. And finally, we have this opportunity. We can go in there and be priests in Russia and, and evangelize the Russian peoples. Um, he initially said, sure, I, certainly, I will, I will definitely, I, I want to do this. Let's do this. Um, but then he went through that process of discernment. He was a Jesuit. And the Jesuits, they really, really go through the process of discernment. So he went through the full process of discernment. And he finally came to the conclusion, against his own inclination, that it was not the will of God. And he told his friend, his, his, his priest friend, yeah, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do this. But afterwards, after he had made that decision, he did not have peace of soul. And um, reflecting for a while, he realized, and discussing again, he realized that maybe it was what God wanted him to do. So that's only when, I think, when, when uh, we're sort of very advanced in the spiritual life, we can, we can detect these movements. And we can carefully distinguish between where God is working and where, where ourselves are, are working or, or perhaps a natural spirit is working. It is, as I say, the very art of life to be guided by God in all that we do. So there's two things above all that we need. First of all, not to claim that we are acting under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost when we could very well be acting under our own inspiration. And then secondly, to seek out carefully what the Holy Ghost wants of us, especially in the more important decisions we have to make, perhaps the decision of, of, of our vocation, uh, the, the decision of, of where we want to live, or the decision of who we're going to marry, or you know, all kinds of decisions that can be very important. And we should consider how wonderful it is for us to be guided by the Holy Ghost, by God himself, in the things that we do. Because we fulfill the very plan that God himself has for us in our lives. This vision that, that God has for our happiness is, is the very best vision possible for your happiness. You cannot sort of reinvent um, uh, uh, your, the plan for your life and make it better. It have, the, have the happiness outcome possibly be better than what God has in store for you. You know that has to be true. No one has charge of your happiness or knows better what you need to be happy than God. So if we place ourselves under the guidance of God, in what we do, and we follow that plan, you will certainly be maximally happy in this life. Today, in, in that sequence, the Holy Ghost is referred to as our, as our paraclete, or our advocate, sort of uh, like our, someone who solicits on our behalf. He's called the highest gift of God, fire, charity, and spiritual anointing. Um, we want to place ourselves entirely under his divine flu influence, and we should, we should cry out constantly for his guidance. We should not hesitate, even briefly, to ask um, God for, for light, for the, the Holy Ghost for light, perhaps in these very words that are, are in that sequence today. Come Holy Ghost, send forth the heavenly rays of your light, bend what is stiff, warm what is cold, rule over what is wayward. Fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.